everyone to our Good Friday meditation. And as we worship God the Creator, we acknowledge the Aboriginal peoples of the Wurundjeri, of the Kulin Nation, who are the traditional custodians of the land on which we live and worship. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Let us pray. Almighty God, look with mercy on this your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and to be given into the hands of sinners and to suffer death upon the cross, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one Lord, for ever and ever. Amen. And we sing, My Song is Love Unknown.
shows his great love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We must die to sin if we are to live. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith. Christ, we are stripped bare by your suffering. You see our dreams, our demons, and the secrets we keep, even from ourselves. Forgive all that needs to be forgiven. Heal all that needs to be healed. Awaken all the good that sleeps in us. Banish all the fears that paralyse us. Put the power of your cross into our lives forever and clothe us with hope and love. Amen. The cross is at the centre of our worship. We remember this day the lengths to which Christ went to do the Father's will. His obedience to the Father took him to Calvary. May we also be so at one with the Father that we too will take up our cross and follow in the Saviour's way of sacrifice. We are assured of forgiveness through Jesus Christ. Let us bear the fruits of our repentance and forgiveness. Amen. And our first reading, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Two others also, who were criminals, were led away to be put to death with him. When they came to the place that is called the Skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. One of the criminals, who were hanged there, kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he replied, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. If we look at the four Gospels, we find that together they record that Jesus spoke seven separate times in the three hours that he hung on the cross. These seven sayings, very much more than a single word in length, are often called the seven last words from the cross. And they are sayings that are deeply cherished by Christians. It is God, we should remember, who is speaking from the cross. For as Christians we believe that Jesus is God. In formal terms we call him the second person of the Blessed Trinity, and he is God even as he is crucified. With Jesus' final sayings, we can focus on the words first for what they tell us about ourselves, and this is valuable, but what is probably even more important is what we can learn from these words about God. We tend to think that when God speaks these words when God speaks to us, it is from a faraway place of peace and perfection. But when we hear these words from the cross, they are the words of God from a place of deep and extreme sorrow and horror. What new things do they tell us about ourselves? What new insights do we gain for our faith in God? I'm going to speak now about what Jesus' words, truly I tell you, 
Today you will be with me in paradise, which come from Luke's Gospel, which we just heard read uh, from the passage from which those words come. I'm going to speak a little about those. And those words form what we call the second word from the cross. We know that Jesus is not crucified alone. Three men are being crucified all together at the site outside Jerusalem. Three men and three crosses. Two of the men are criminals, maybe robbers or thugs of some kind. And Jesus is hanging between them. We heard in our reading how both of the criminals start to focus on Jesus and to speak to him. This is a much loved part of the crucifixion story from Luke's Gospel. We are drawn into the scene and we start to see ourselves in these two criminals, these two different people. And then we see the overwhelming grace that flows from Jesus as he speaks, even though he is in great agony. Listen to what the men say and what Jesus says in reply to them. The man on the left of Jesus hears the crowd around that is mocking Jesus and the soldiers who are taunting him and calling him the King of the Jews. And the man takes his cue from them. He says to Jesus, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. Maybe he sees Jesus as the means of some last minute, impossible sounding escape. He certainly can't see any sign of Jesus' power in this crucifixion. How could someone who is really the Son of God be in this horror? Before we dismiss this man and what he has to say, we must admit that most of us would not have wanted to be connected to anything so shameful as death by crucifixion. The cross is very ambiguous, isn't it? It is the best known symbol of Christianity. It is also a sign of suffering and of failure. It is natural to ask how the suffering of the cross could serve any good purpose. It is natural also not to associate in our minds our God with suffering. And when we do think of our God in relation to suffering, it is often in the context of him, of our God, bringing suffering upon us for our sins. Some Christians have even given this interpretation in the light of the COVID-19 crisis. But here we have something very different. We have Christ, that is God, himself suffering, himself appearing to be a complete failure and to be uh, scorned by those around him. He tells us that in the COVID-19 pandemic, if we're looking for where God is, it is not as a wrathful God punishing us, but God is to be found in the suffering of those who have this disease and in all the work and the love being shown by those who are seeking to combat the pandemic. we return to the two criminals on either side of Jesus, we can notice how the other criminal, the one on the right, who is also in this horror, sees something different in Jesus and in the situation. Unlike the man on the left, he has put completely out of his mind any thoughts of escape. His thoughts move in a different direction. He admits his own guilt and he rebukes the other criminal saying, we are getting what we deserve for our deed. 
Jesus, but this man Jesus has done nothing wrong. This criminal then turns to Jesus and he says, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. You might know the Taze chant that uses those same words, Jesus, remember me. Now, just let us think about that word remembering. In the Old Testament, when it says, God remembered, it has a distinct meaning. It doesn't just mean to think about or to bring to mind. In Jewish understanding, when God remembers, he doesn't just think, he also acts. He acts for us, for our salvation. So this man is asking Jesus that he be remembered in some way when Jesus comes into his kingdom, that Jesus takes some action on his behalf. In some way, by the gift of God's grace, this criminal is able to perceive that he has done wrong himself, but also that the man hanging in the middle cross is a king. What did this man see in the dying and tortured face of Jesus? What kind of kingship could he possibly have been spared? Earthly kingship? Maybe divine kingship? Maybe. The man would have heard Jesus mocked as the king of the Jews, and he would have heard Jesus say, Father, forgive them. Perhaps he made something of this. Could the crucified criminal on Jesus' night see something that day that no one else could? Could he see that the power of God most truly resides not in signs and wonders, not even in miracles? and that Jesus' power was being made known that day by his death. Or did the man believe that Jesus was indeed a king in the ordinary sense, who had been somehow wrongly convicted and sentenced to death, though he was innocent? Did he know that when Jesus spoke of his kingdom, it was the kingdom of God, the kingship of God that he was referring to? It is difficult for us to say, but what we can see is that the man, this criminal, showed a faith in Jesus, and that is like anyone else who is present. So how does Jesus respond to the man? He says, and here is our word from the cross, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. The word paradise here came from the Persian language into the Greek and Aramaic languages, and it originally meant a walled garden, a paradise. By this point of time in Jewish understanding, the word had come to mean a very particular walled garden, that is, the Garden of Eden. It gives us a wonderful image of heaven, uh, flowers and fountains with living water, fruit, and God who walks there in the cool of the evening. Jewish tradition had it that after Adam and Eve were expelled from the Garden of Eden, the garden was walled up and was to remain so until the age to come when it would be reopened and people would be able to eat of the fruit of the tree of life again. We see this tradition reflected in some of the writing in the book of Revelation. So Jesus is not simply having a personal conversation here with a criminal who now repents and will join Jesus in paradise. Important as that conversation is. What Luke is telling us here is that it is specifically as a result of Jesus' death this day that paradise is to be reopened. The man who has shown faith in Jesus will join him in the newly reopened paradise. Many scholars consider this to be the absolute high point of Luke's account 
of Jesus' passion and death. And that is because here is depicted for us the whole story of salvation in miniature. The two criminals represent all of us, you and me, with our sinfulness and self-seeking, our casting aside of the meaning of the cross, our partial understanding of who Jesus is, all of that. And then, by contrast, Jesus' steady love for us. Jesus is saying, I forgive you. That is, I reconcile you. All the peoples of this world who know your own poverty, your own failings. I reconcile you to God. I forgive you. I count as nothing all that you have done. I make a place for you again with me forever. Today, you will be with me in paradise. In our second reading this morning, it's from Matthew. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? From noon on, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At about three o'clock, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, Lema Sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, this man is calling for Elijah. At once, one of them ran and got a sponge, filled, filled it with sour wine, put it on a stick and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. Then Jesus cried again with a loud voice and breathed his last. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. After his resurrection, they came out of the tombs and entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now when the centurion and those with him who were keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and what took place. They were terrified and said, Truly, this man was God's son. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? These words from the reading we just heard make up what we call the fourth of the seven words from the cross. It's in contrast to the second word, which I've just spoken about, which showed how even in the darkest time of Jesus' crucifixion, something new and good was being proclaimed, that is, salvation for humankind. In the fourth word, Jesus is calling directly to God, to his Father, his Father and our Father. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? These are words which seem full of despair, expressing a sense by Jesus of complete abandonment by God, of desolation, and from which nothing good will appear. Of Jesus' seven words from the cross, this one is seen as representing the saddest and lowest moment of all. The Gospel account gives the words first in Aramaic, which is the language Jesus spoke of every day. Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani. And then comes the translation from the Greek into the Greek. This suggests but there was a memory in the early Christian community of these words 
as Jesus had actually spoken them. The words Jesus is using come from the beginning of Psalm 22, from verse 1 of that psalm. Now, in the Jewish religious life, it is common to quote just the first word or line of a prayer or a psalm or a song as a kind of shorthand, and you expect your audience to understand that by quoting a little bit from the beginning of it, you are referring to the whole of that prayer or psalm or song or whatever it is. So what this means is that Jesus may in fact have gasped out the whole of the psalm as his prayer, and not just the first few words as the writer of the Gospel recorded. We, the readers of the Gospel, may be meant to automatically hear the whole psalm in our heads. Let us look a little at how the psalm continues. Verse 1 has begun, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? And continues, Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? And then listen to verse 7. They that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out their lips at me and wag their heads. And verses 18 and 19. They stand staring and gazing upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. This seems to show that Matthew, who wrote the Gospel from which this fourth word is taken, is not, um, and maybe Jesus himself, must have seen strong echoes between the psalm and what was happening to Jesus on the cross. In other words, Jesus was in despair. He truly felt alone, abandoned, and was without any sense of God's presence. This tells us that even Jesus felt alone and could not seem to reach any sense of God in, in this. And it reminds us that it is human to feel like this from time to time. Because we cannot sense God does not mean that God is not there, but it also means that no person, certainly no Christian, is immune from feeling great despair from time to time. I might just say here that there are some scholars who ask us to notice that if we come to the last verses of this psalm, of Psalm 22, there are words of hope and a knowledge of the ultimate justice of God in those words. So perhaps we are to understand that this meant that Jesus held these somehow in his heart at the same time as he experienced great despair and a sense of being forsaken. That is a possibility, but it is not the most usual interpretation applied to these words. Many of us have endured a sense of such utter desolation as Jesus on the cross, and most of us have experienced moments when our lives seem not to have any meaning or any sense of the presence of God. We may be faced with suffering that appears to have no end and no purpose at all. Or we may be close to someone who is suffering in this way. We may have been faced, for example, with the death of a member of our family or the loss of a small child in an accident illness and many people around the world are currently either experiencing the loss of a loved one from the COVID-19 virus 
or themselves are experiencing it and fearing that they will not recover. In those circumstances, we do cry out, why, why, where is God now? When a tragedy befalls someone, they will ask the question, where is God now? As Christians, we may be terrified that we have nothing meaningful to say in response. In my own experience, it is best not to launch into pious words or religious cliches in these circumstances. It is best to be there and to trust that God is there too. When in doubt, stay silent or keep what you do say short and very simple. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Leads us honestly to ask, what God do we believe in? Is he really the God who reveals himself in Jesus, the crucified one, and who is not at our beck and call, who can't be known except through the heart? Most of us are prepared to have a God who tests us, but we do expect to be rescued before things go totally wrong. And we don't have the type of faith that Jesus showed he had in his life. We tend to keep returning to the idea of a God who is at our service, or at the service of power or of our success, not a God to whom we paradoxically can and should entrust ourselves completely, even when we cannot sense his presence and even when the worst has happened as it was for Jesus. There are a number of theologians who say that this part of Jesus dying and his words, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? And his sense of abandonment here teach us about the reality of God and what the love of God entails in the most profound and stark way. Recall how in the beginning of the reading we heard, we hear how from noon on, darkness comes over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And then later in the reading we hear, then Jesus cried again with a loud voice and breathed his last, and that is at three o'clock in the afternoon. So there are theologians who interpret this period of three hours of darkness, the last three hours of Jesus' life, as the kind of prototype, the divine model of what we call the dark night of the soul, that Christian mystics have experienced and written about through the centuries. The dark night of the soul is the experience of complete spiritual desolation that many saints and other faithful Christians experience in their life journey of faith. An experience that encompasses an overwhelming sense of loss and abandonment by God, and anguish and suffering and loneliness beyond describing. The theologian Hans Urs von Balthasar said that Jesus experienced this dark night of the soul in an even greater intensity than saints or any other Christian in this period from noon to three as he hung on the cross. So great was the intensity of his experience that it had a, a manifestation, a, a reflection, so to speak, in the created world. Thus the darkness over the land of the street. But what theologians conclude from this is that the abandonment, the anguish, the loneliness, the isolation, the lack of faith and hope that God will make his presence known to us, all of this is a way for us towards truly knowing Christ. It is a hard way, but it is 
is a way pioneered by Christ. Through the darkness, the sense of abandonment and of meaninglessness comes eventually a stronger sense of God's presence with us. We don't have to be saints on the path to sainthood to experience a dark night of the soul somewhere in our Christian lives. Boredom and dryness and weariness and a sense of darkness are all frequently a part of our lives as Christians. But these realities can be interpreted from the perspective of Christ's experience of his own desolation as he hangs from the cross. We are all called to be where Christ was and to know God in the same way. And since Christ's power revealed itself in weakness, since God's light was revealed in darkness on those hours on the cross, since God's glory and hope were revealed in Jesus' cry of pain and abandonment, so we too, in some way, are called to know a different God from the one we have often imagined. We're going to have a lost sheep story now. But I just need to warn you, normally the lost sheep stories are uh, humorous at some level, but this one isn't at all, it's very sad. Um, but that's because today is a day when we focus uh, our attention on the sad truth of the death of Jesus. The way of the cross began in the garden. Jesus prayed and prayed while his friends slept. One friend had not been praying or dreaming. Jesus, Judas had been plotting and scheming, he led the guards to grab Jesus. They dragged him before the chief priests and the Bible experts. Are you the son of God? asked the experts. Meanwhile, Jesus' friend Peter joined the crowd in the courtyard. Are you a friend of Jesus? asked a girl. No, said Peter, Jesus is not my friend. The rooster crowed. The priests delivered Jesus to the Roman ruler Pilate. He's no king, cried the crowd. Send him to the cross. He's no criminal, whispered Pilate's life. Let him leave. Are you the king of the Jews? asked Pilate. If you say so, Jesus replied. Pilate kept asking him questions. But Jesus gave him no answers. Pilate gave up on his questions and handed Jesus to the soldiers. The soldiers wrapped Jesus in a royal robe and placed a crown upon his head. The crown was made from spikes and thorns. Hooray for the king, laughed the soldiers. Then Jesus carried the cross. Simon from Cyrene was passing by. The soldiers stopped him and forced Simon to help Jesus carry the cross. The women of Jerusalem gathered to comfort Jesus. Jesus could not comfort the women of Jerusalem. Jesus was hung upon the cross. Jesus, remember me when you enter your kingdom, said the criminal. Soon we will stand together in the king's garden, promised Jesus. Jesus looked down from the cross and saw two people that he loved, two people that loved him. He said to Mary, his mother, Woman, John is now your son. He said to John, My friend, here is your mother. From that day on, Mary lived in John's home. Jesus died on the cross. 
Joseph from Arimathea and Nicodemus the Pharisee took the body of their friend Jesus. They wrapped him in a linen cloth and placed him in a garden tomb. The tomb was sealed with a heavy stone. The way of the cross led to the tomb. But this story has not ended. This story has just begun. And our third word, it is finished. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put the sponge full of wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. We have just heard from our reading from John. Now Jesus has said he is thirsty and has received sour wine, held up to him on a branch of hyssop by some bystanders. And then Jesus says, it is finished. The word finished is ambiguous in the English language. It can just mean it's over, as if dinner time was finished. Or even we may say it is finished, meaning this is the end, I can't take any more. It is finished. Or finished in English may mean completed. For example, I may say to a friend, how are you going with that dress that you are making? And she may say it is finished, meaning it is completed. However, in Greek, which is the language of the New Testament, there isn't this ambiguity, these two shades of meaning. In Greek, it is finished always means it is completed in the fullest sense. Something has been accomplished. It has been brought to its final goal and fulfilment. And this is what Jesus is saying with his dying breath. It is finished. It's completed. He's saying much more than I am about to die right now. It is finished. He's certainly not saying that he can't take it anymore or that he is defeated. What he is saying, rather, is that he has conquered he has done what he came to the world to do, as the word made flesh. Remember how earlier in John's Gospel, in chapter 4, Jesus' disciples asked him at one point why he hasn't eaten. And he replies, My food is to do the will of he who sent me, and to complete his work. And what work was that that Jesus needed to complete? Right at the beginning of John's Gospel in the prologue, that is the beginning of chapter 1, we are told about this work, that Jesus has come into the world to be the light of all people, to be a light that shines in the darkness and that darkness cannot overcome. This is a wonderful image of our world as enveloped in a darkness where things will never be able to be truly right 
And then Jesus being the light, the only light, that is strong enough to melt away that darkness and to stand up to it and triumph. As John the Baptist proclaims in chapter 1 of John's Gospel, Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So Jesus is here for the greatest of all tasks, the saving of the world, of you and me, of putting to rights what is not right for all time. And now on the cross, Jesus declares, it is indeed completed. Jesus has lived out his full work of salvation. He has been lifted up on the cross not for humiliation, although that may be the view of the world and many of its people. From God's perspective, however, Jesus has been lifted up for glory. And it is truly glory, because what could be more glorious than, these, than this victory, which is the greatest of all victories, having been won. Now this is a victory that is won forever. It is finished, accomplished, made perfect. This absolute completion of this victory is a difficult part of the Christian faith for us to understand. We tend to think that yes, we are receiving this gift of salvation earned by Jesus Christ through his death. But there must also be more that we need to add to it, to earn it in some way for ourselves. If we think that, then we are thinking that Jesus' victory is not truly finished or completed. And this manifests itself in many ways, this kind of misunderstanding or this forgetting of the final and absolute victory having been completed. In my own ministry I can recall how different people have spoken to me from time to time about things they have done in their lives that were quite wrong and that they now deeply regret or someone who may have hurt very badly. These people have prayed long and hard, and then they have said to me something like, they hope they are forgiven, but in their hearts they are not sure. This is understandable, but what it really means, if you think about it, is that we are not sure whether Jesus' work in taking away the sin of the world does really extend to us and to our particular circumstances. It is difficult for all of us to believe that Christ's work is complete. We feel that we have to do something more in order to earn its benefits. In the Old Testament, before Jesus' time, the Jewish people believed that they could sacrifice an animal as a sin offering to make atonement for the sin they had committed, and the sin would be forgiven. But the difficulty was that for the sin to remain forgiven, the animal sacrifice needed to be done over and over again every time there was a sin. Now there are insights that we can get here from the letter to the Hebrews, which is addressed to a community of Christians who are living in a society with a range of different religious beliefs and who are being tempted to adopt some or all of those beliefs. We can gain an insight about sacrifice once and for all, or sacrifice that needs to be repeated. Members of the Indonesian congregation in one of the parishes in which I served spoke to me about their particular experiences, which were somewhat like the Christians in the letter to the Hebrews, living in a country where there were different religious beliefs, uh, the practices of which could be observed at any time. They were used to the temptation which exists for 
Christians, particularly in rural Indonesia, to take up some of the folk religious practices which they could see being enacted in the local markets. In particular, it's common there to sacrifice a rooster to atone for sins committed or to aid as an answer to prayers. A relative or a friend of a Christian who was in some kind of difficulty would often say that surely this couldn't hurt this sacrificing a rooster and maybe it would help. Now all of us have prayers that seem unanswered and the real sorrows in our lives or things that remain on our conscience. So you can see how tempting it would be to pay a little money for the sacrifice of a rooster. But the letter to the Hebrews reminds us that these same sacrifices are made year after year and can't make us perfect or make all things fundamentally right. Otherwise, the sacrifices would have ceased to be offered. Hebrews says it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats, and I think we can add roosters, to take away sins. The example of the Indonesian rural marketplace is stark, and it's easy for us to see there the point that's being made. But we all have equivalents to those practices in our own lives. And it is best to remember that God's gifts of forgiveness, reconciliation, resurrection, and eternal life cannot be earned. They are divine gifts beyond our capacity to earn through any means at all. And it's already been done for us, accomplished through the self-giving of Jesus Christ. By his suffering and death on the cross, it is finished. It is once and for all. We turn now to a time of prayer. God of the crucified Jesus, we pray for the church, that we may be courageous in carrying the cross, compassionate in forgiving our enemies, and willing to use our gifts in love for all for whom Jesus died. God of the crucified Jesus, we pray for Australia that our nation may be both just and generous and experience the grace that comes from losing life and finding it. God of the crucified Jesus, we pray for our families and friends that according to their individual needs, your divine strength may be experienced in human weakness and Lord. hopes that have been buried may germinate and grow and be ready for a resurrection. God of the crucified Jesus, we pray for each of us here that we may be lifted above anxieties, guilt, bewilderment, pain or fear. And by the mercy of Jesus, who bore our sorrows and carried our shame, Find peace at the foot of the Holy Cross. Blessed be your name, God of the crucified, friend of the needy and forsaken. And we pray together in the words that Jesus gave us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And we'll sing, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross.
written on our hearts, and the salvation of the world is in your outstretched hands. Keep your victory always before our eyes, your praise on our lips, your peace in our lives. Amen.